Hi everybody, welcome back. So how did I happen to the Mongols MC anyway, you may ask? In episode three, Mongols in My Space, I'm going to explain how my big ass mouth, social media, and a charismatic and, and intelligent Pied Piper of the Mongols MC launched me, Blue, into being Blue S-Y-L-M. Don't go away. I'm going to break it all down for you when we get back. Welcome back to my agenda, excuse me, my YouTube channel. In the last couple of episodes, I unpacked some conditions um, that brought the Mongols to Oregon, as well as introducing the twins. That was not my best work, and I'm super sorry about that. I really should have done better by them, but I got too high and too agitated. And the one thing the twins know about me is when I'm high and agitated, I do dumb stuff. I gave you guys some context. And remember context, people. It's important to talk about ideas more than events and way more than it isn't to talk about people. Join me in learning the more complicated stuff. But real quick, before we get into all this, I want to let you guys know I'm going to shoot a little video of a matrix that explains the conditions in episode one and two a little better. Another thing, I am offering myself to save the lives of Oregonians. I don't need any money. I don't need your money. This isn't a monetized YouTube. I don't have any intention of monetizing it. Um, I'm risking the rest of my choices to save what's left of theirs. So please, if you feel the need to give money or talk about money or money's on your mind, I highly recommend you dip into my description and you can find the nonprofits that my stripper company, Team Blue, hustled and donated to over the years. Team Blue's mission was we hustle for those that can't hustle for themselves right now. And I encourage my subscribers and my viewers to do the same. Once again, thank you all for showing me so much love and support. It really makes my heart feel nice. And please don't forget to like this video and subscribe because it gives me energy to fight forward. MySpace was the first social media platform that I had really ever been on. I spent a lot of time online. I was an office manager for a boutique CPA firm in Beaverton, and we perform mandatory um, audits and filings for labor unions and trusts. The founder of my company, Ben Middleton, once said, we make sure that the guys that are out there with rain running down their butt crack get every dime coming to them. That was our company's kind of agenda and motto. His son, Steve, was my boss, and he had to fire most of our clients when the IRS and the DOL um, required that these filings be done online. This was before high-speed internet and before DigSig was really, really had their shit together. So it was a technical disaster. Because I had more advanced technical skills and education and experience in that area. I was the IT, uh, was the in-house IT person. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? But I spent a lot of time on the internet trying to fix this issue. I had to problem solve software and hardware issues. I had to call um, Washington DC all the time and help them as an end user, try to establish what they needed to do on their end to make sure the end users could actually use the product that they were supplying. But other than that, my job was cake and I just surfed the web a lot. I was also working as a stripper at a very popular strip club called the Acropolis. Steak bites! Gross. The Acropolis is Greek-owned like her bodies. Portland has a a very big Greek presence in the bar uh, in the bar scene, and as a rule of thumb, the Greeks are really cool with one percenters and white gang bangers. Remember, that's a vernacular; that's not a definition. So the Gypsy Jokers were in a lot during the day, but since I didn't really work during the day, I didn't really see them. They were jerks in the bar. They'd make you walk around them, and they didn't tip. I also worked as a bouncer at a very popular Irish pub called Kells. Kells hosts the biggest Irish festival west of the Mississippi. 
I moved over to Kells from Justin's crew because Nate asked that Justin loan me out for a while and move me over to Kells, which that's something that the crews used to do back in the day because Nate, Gustav, and Bitter Joey were leaving or going to be gone, or they were gone. And Nate didn't want Kells to be left high and dry, so I slid over. Little side story. When Bitter Joey found out that I was hired at Kells, he said to Nate, don't hire her. She's too mean for our customers. So you might wonder why I had all these jobs. Why was I always at work? Well, let me give you a little background about me. In 1985, my cunt mother, Lynn McCall, paid a pedophile stalker rapist, Dennis Coy, $400 in the middle of the night to take me out of her house. She's your problem now. Those were her words. Of course, she canceled the check the next business day. This action thrust me into a whole other life. The Coys were hardcore addicts, predators, and racists. I was now living a thoroughly outlaw existence. In 2002, when I attempted to remove myself from the danger and my children from the danger, it just got worse. My white children lined up against me and took up weapons and threats and stood behind their dad. My life had become so messy and dangerous because of my children and my husband that it was actually not super safe for me to be at home. And it wasn't super safe for me to be without people like bouncers around me, making sure that I was okay. So let's get back to it. So I got a call from Justin Norton uh, rest in peace, bro. Justin was the head of one of the bigger security crews downtown. And I worked with that crew, the Samoans, Kells, and Big Mikey's crew. So when Justin came to ask me to do the door again, I, you know, I kind of inquired, like, why? What's going on? He said, look, there's a new motorcycle club in town. Since your dad's a one percenter, we think you can handle the door. We think it would be best if you handle the door because we don't feel like they're going to crash the bar. They've been crashing doors all over town and we don't feel like they're going to crash the bar if you're there. So, of course, I agreed, but I did go and talk to my dad because I wasn't really sure what I was in for. I wanted to know about this one percenter club and I figured he would know. By the way, Justin Norton, he gave me my name blue. So I reach out to my bio daddy. His name is 220 or Electric Bill, one percenter, rest in peace, dad. Um, he had been in the scene for quite a few years and first he was with Solutions when Kelly was P, and then some political weird stuff happened, and some of the guys moved over to Brother Speed. I think that that's right. So a little side note about motorcycle clubs. They are so, so, so political, and a lot more like coffee clatch sometimes than breaking the law and riding. No offense, guys, but that's that's just my experience. Anyway, my dad and I met up at the Portland Brother Speed Clubhouse. And when I brought up the Mongols, he seemed ultra agitated. We don't talk about them. Like not like a dude agitated, like bitchy ag agitated. And I was a little bit confused about that. And I kind of inquired again. He said, I don't want you to have anything to do with them. They aren't like us. They aren't good people. <laughs> Smell the racism in that? Okay. So anyway, I flash back a little bit to the reverence that my dad and his brothers paid to the Jokers when they rolled up to the Portland clubhouse during one of their potlucks. It was exactly the same way that dudes act when Mongols roll up to an event. Men will be falling all over themselves, seeking approval while trying not to pee their pants. It is weird to watch men bitch down like that. My dad says to me, um, it's good that they came. This is really good for us. And my dad fluttered around a couple of old heads for a while. And I just sat there stunned. And then I saw Joker Josh roll up and I walked over and gave him a hug and we talked a while. My dad couldn't believe that I knew him. But Josh and I had been workout partners. 
he would get off work at Precision Cast Parts. I think he was over in Titanium and at like three o'clock in the morning and I'd get off whatever stripper shift and we'd work out at 24 hour fitness over at 205. And then like when I was doing the door over at Dante's, he'd come talk shit. He'd rap with me. He'd brought this weird, he had this weird uncle that he'd bring around with him. I don't know what was up with that guy, but, um, he'd rap with me and we'd talk shit at the limbo lounge door and, and we were pretty good friends and we were pretty good friends before all that stuff happened before all the ugly happened. Josh, Joker Josh, unlike the twins, allowed himself to be a big fish in a small pond. And there was nothing to fight for and there was nothing to defend. And when clannish men don't have anything to fight real on the outside, they will turn in and destroy everything around them. And that's exactly what he did. He destroyed my sister, my sister, because all women are my sisters, but he destroyed his life and he destroyed a woman. And he quit. I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest. He quit. He took a knee and quit. So I knew Josh before he quit. So back to old softy 221 percenter. He ordered me not to get involved in, in any way, including doing the door at Dante's and told me that I would probably get killed if I tried. But my dad was a lot of things and he street wasn't one of them. Hard or aggressive or violent wasn't either. My great grandma used to call him Wild Willie. He was a good time. He wasn't a dangerous time. He was just a nice old guy that wanted to have friends and ride motorcycles. But my loyalty holds strong if I don't have a dog in the fight, and I didn't. So my daddy didn't like them, and neither did I. So I took over the door at Dante's on Fridays, and I was at Kells, which is really close on Saturdays in case something went down. But nothing popped off. It was super, super quiet. Of course, the weather was getting really nasty and it sucks riding in the rain no matter how hardcore you are. About three weeks later, the Flogging Molly show at the Roseland Theater popped off. It was a cool show, but it was a Drambuie show and I can't stand Drambuie. And it was like the third Drambuie show in that number of weeks that I had attended. I was standing in the drink line and I felt this, these hands on my arm. And as a bouncer and a stripper, I have lost that frontal cortex, socially acceptable behavior brain path for women that says when you're handled, you need to act right and don't act, don't act bitchy and don't overreact because, you know, it's not that big of a deal. But I lost that. Um, as a bouncer, it's not safe for people to handle me. And as a stripper, motherfucker, uh, you're not paying. So I instantly jerked my, I instinct instinct instinctually jerked my arm out of this unknown offender's grasp to look down and see a little tiny mongol in a mongol cut he barked at me he goes let me see your tattoo but i was surrounded by about 20 people and I was safe to green light his feelings. I am a master at these maths. Don't ever trip. I was a little taller than him and I was still pretty beefy back in those days. So I made myself even bigger and I closed the distance between our egos. Little man, I barked. You better keep your hands off me and keep from pawing me. I promise I'm not the one, bro. And I poked my finger into his hyper white, one percenter diamond patch. And I said, nice white patch. And if you know anything about riding and anything about Oregon, you know, there's no such thing as a white anything on a cut. Oregon Mongols colors were black and road grime. And I pushed him away from me with his one percenter patch. He called me a fucking bitch, of course. Later that night, I noticed three black vests. Two of them had those hyper white patches taking runs at the guard at the bottom of the stairs that go up to the balcony. 
And I honestly couldn't believe what I was seeing. These grown ass men were like acting like fools, charging over and over the stairs and the, the bouncers pushing them back. That was it. This Karen was done. I had seen all I needed to see, and I was going to use out the hours and hours and hours I had free during the day at work to give these guys a spanking on social media. As one patch holder so lovingly put it, you look before you leap and you know it. But that's why people that love you always will. You're, we're not defined by those moments. We're defined by the moments of selflessness when people benefit from your sacrifice. And there's been plenty of that to go around. So I leaped. I got onto my space and I began to talk wild shit about the Mongols MC in my perfect city. My perfect goddamn city. I feel like that was the age of innocence for social media, but I always use that platform as a weapon. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I wasn't scared at all. All of a sudden, bing, friend request, bing, private message. Hey there, I hear you've had some bad experiences with members of my club. It was one of the twins, <laughs> enemy engaged. I sure shit do. And I proceeded to lambaste him with the width and depth of my experience and knowledge of outlaw, bikers, clubs, patch holders, and how it was supposed to be and what the fuck they thought they were doing in my goddamn city. I was a legal secretary for quite a while and I can fire words into the ether faster than you can empty a magazine from an automatic pistol. But this twin wasn't your average Mongol. He was an outlier. He was born at the right time and the right place in history. He took a very specific approach with this very popular person downtown. And he did it over social media. Right place, right time. He says, I'm sorry to hear about this. I think I know who you're talking about and those guys aren't around anymore. We don't do that kind of stuff because number one, it's not our way. It's not the Mongol way the Mongol way, put a pin in that. And it's terrible press. I remember him making a big deal about it being terrible press. The twins understood optics and how important it was to keep dumb shit to a minimum and stay off that radar. This was the big time and the twins had no intention of babysitting drunks and idiots. Oops. What about grimy? That dill hole was at the flogging Molly show too. I didn't know it at the time, I, I realized later. And he was a shit brother. And by the way, Grimy, it's not your club anymore either, is it, bro? I realized who I was talking to after spying on his page. One of the benefit, and another benefit of social media. This twin and I knew the same people. Oregon's small, but Portland's smaller. He was an Oregon wrestler like my family. He was one of those badass little punk rock kids downtown. We were Oregonians, wrestling family, and part of the downtown scene. We understood the same things. Me and him spent many days talk, typing at each other online. I think I mostly talked about my kids. I'm not sure I had tons to say. He talked about his crazy girlfriend, ex-girlfriend at latest, and some context about Oregon One Percenter Clubs the mad ball incident, his twin, his crazy new girlfriend, and the constitutional fight for the patch. This Mongol and I became fast friends. He took time to explain things to me, not club business, but he didn't take some weird superiority approach with me, like, like it's commonly done in the biker scene. I'm often asked by non-patch holders. How do I meet these guys? How do I patch up? Can I be a member? And I tell them, no, you don't meet them. You don't patch up because it's not your journey. Water seeks its own level. If you are not in their orbit, you don't belong there. Stay in your own lane. Having a motorcycle does not make you kindred spirits. Real recognizes real. The twins and I were real outlaws. Outlaws will find other outlaws. If you haven't been found, you aren't one of them. So I hope I did a better job this episode. Gosh, I'm bummed that I 
tanked last episode so badly. Oh man, I'm bummed about that. But I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Next week's episode is Miss January, Mongol Calendar Girl. That's episode four of My Life Without Law Bikers. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of my girl noises. Until then, be safe and baby, be dangerous. Talk to you soon.